He looked at the data they had on the system. It was an unnamed one. Well, technically it was categorized as some random assortment of numbers and the year 2005 AD. But other than that, it seemed to be just another one out of hundreds of millions. Nothing special had been noted about it other than the somewhat curious fluctuating luminosity it had exhibited when they observed it. The only issue was that they were only able to directly observe the star when out of warp, and so any data they had on it was likely decades out of date. For all they knew, it might not even exist anymore when they arrived. Leon frowned. It might not exist. The thought struck a chord in his mind. The mission had been slated to last for twenty years, ten years out and ten years back. What would have changed on their homeworld by the time they returned? Their ship travelled faster than the speed of light, but did so insulated from the time-warping effects of relativity. This meant that their twenty years would be nearly identical to twenty years back on Earth, give or take a bit from their close encounter with a black hole that might have shaved a few hours off that total. No, their journey was not one through time as many science fiction writers had speculated throughout history. Their journey was one of personal commitment and the endurance of the human spirit. The ship had been designed to run for at least 50 years before needing to refuel its nuclear power plants. The hydroponics could sustain themselves for even longer if they had access to light and warmth. The weakest link on board the ship by far was them, bags of meat and blood and bone that required the most stable conditions in the galaxy in order to function. What would become of their mission should they all die before it was over? Would Henry take their corpses home? Or would the ship be hurled out into that great inky abyss, never to be seen or heard from again? These dark thoughts were interrupted by the yellow alert lights flashing on. Samuel announced, Warp translation in five minutes. Please secure yourselves and enjoy the ride. He spoke with confidence, but his voice was still little more than a hoarse rasp. The damage that had been done to his throat was likely permanent, Dr. Kimathi had explained to him. It would forever be a reminder to him and others of the consequences of madness. Joyce and the other members of the bridge crew continued working in the silence that followed Samuel's announcement. The occasional clicking of harnesses, the only sound that disturbed the quiet. Leon shuddered. He hated this part, the waiting, the anticipation of a warp translation. It was always uncomfortable, always a mind-rupturing experience, sometimes more so than others. The yellow lights continued to flash at him, silent for the moment in their steady mocking. He gritted his teeth as the amber lights flashed faster, accompanied with a short alarm that pulsed every five seconds. He understood the importance of the procedure. You really didn't want to get caught out and unawares by a warp jump. It seemed that the only place one was free of its negative effects was if they were asleep. Leon wished he was asleep. Far too fast for Leon's liking, the ship reached the point of translation with Samuel counting it down. Translation in ten. Brace. Five. Four. Three. Two. On. Leon cocked his head. Nothing had happened. Curiously, he looked around and noticed in alarm that he was surrounded by nothing. No, not nothing, but an infinite plane of pure white light. Well, this is a new one, he muttered aloud. As soon as he finished the sentence, the space around him rippled, and he frowned. Leon looked around, his body seeming to float in this endless place. Hello, is anyone? Anything there? The space seemed to react to his voice, the walls of eternity crashing down and compressing the space. The sound of rushing wind filled his ears for a minute, as the weight of everything pushed towards him in an instant. He gasped in shock and the sound ceased. Leon was a bit more than apprehensive now. He wasn't really scared. There was nothing in the strange place to be scared of. He looked around and then asked, Uh, how do I leave? As he asked the question, he began to notice a noise, a kind of a groaning sound that came from all directions. He thought harder about wanting to get the hell out of there as the noise continued to grow in volume. He blinked. In front of him was a doorway. It had not been there before. He would have certainly noticed it if it had. It looked severely out of place. It was not some high-tech or even magical-looking portal. Instead, it was a simple wooden door, rough in its construction with a simple brass hoop and no lock. He couldn't exactly explain why, but the door looked incredibly familiar. Not like any he could remember seeing in his life, but almost like the echo of a memory. He reached for the door and the space shuddered again, 
this time seeming to close in on all sides. Leon gave a shout of alarm and tore the door open. It was full of stars. Well, not exactly, but that was the impression his mind gave him as he debated what to do for a moment. A screech echoing through the now deafening wind made up his mind for him. Leon threw himself through the open door into the sea of lights. As the door slammed behind him, he could have sworn the wind resolved itself into words as some incomprehensible voice shouted for him to come back. He shook his head as he tumbled through the endless seeming abyss. Or was he floating motionlessly? It was impossible to tell. There was no air, no light or sound other than the pinpricks and himself. He opened his mouth to yell and blinked. What the f- He cut himself off as he realized he was sitting on the bridge of the ship. The yellow alert lights were off and everyone looked little the worse for wear. Joyce glanced at him as she rubbed her head. You too, huh? I hate warp jumps. She muttered loud enough for him to hear. I was just, but what was, he muttered to himself. Samuel spoke up. Warp translation was successful. They always are, he muttered, loud enough for Leon to hear his rough whisper. We are now in system of, well, whatever that is. He gestured towards the main view screen. The main shutters of the bridge windows were closed, as was standard procedure. The screen showed a clearly magnified view of the inner system, one that almost immediately grabbed Leon's attention. The small child inside of him bounced up and out of its hiding place as he couldn't help but exclaim in his excitement. Oh wow, that's a cataclysmic variable binary. Terry nodded, but Sabine seemed a bit more confused by the statement. Okay, what's that? Terry patted her husband on the back, Taylor looking miserable as he almost always did after warp jumps. She turned on the second main view screen and focused it on the smaller whiter dot that was next to the main star. A cataclysmic variable star is a white dwarf that orbits so close to its binary partner that its considerable gravitational pull is able to lift matter directly off its larger companion. Unchecked, this will almost always result in a Class I a supernova detonation and sometimes the destruction of the entire solar system. Sabine just nodded. Okay, so it's bad then. Leon shook his head. No, not really. I mean, the chances of a detonation are astronomically small. But not zero, Leon cocked his head at Sabine's question. What? He couldn't help but ask what she meant. I mean, a near zero chance is still infinitely higher than zero, right? Sabine pointed out. Terry shrugged, the movement causing the harness she wore to clatter in the microgravity of the bridge. I mean, yes, technically, but we are talking about a truly astronomically small chance of it happening while we are here to witness it. Leon nodded. It was true, but a small part of him remembered his thoughts from earlier. What if their mission was cursed to fail all along? A random supernova was just the kind of unpredictable event to do it. A tiny chance at catastrophe. It wasn't technically off the table that something terrible could happen, but he didn't realistically think it was worth worrying about. I can't foresee anything happening while we are here, Sabine. On the off chance that it does, well, we will have more than enough time to detect the build-up, I'm sure. Terry nodded. Evidence suggests that at least one hour preceding the detonation, the white dwarf will suddenly increase in brightness as activity sparks back to life on its surface. This activity will continue to ramp up till this new runaway reaction rips the star apart in a brilliant explosion. Once the blast begins to propagate, then it's already too late to escape, as the flood of high-density light would burn us to ash at this range. She explained in a rush. Leon gestured to the screen. See? No light build-up. We are perfectly safe. Sabine didn't look entirely convinced, but he wasn't terribly worried. They had a rare opportunity to study a siphoning binary pair. He wasn't going to let it go to waste. Especially since the beautiful spectacle gave him another idea. Putting the emerging thoughts to the side, Leon set about making sure the bridge crew were all working on their assigned duties with Joyce's help. Taylor began testing the system for any artificial signals, Leon wasn't expecting to find any, but it never hurt to make absolutely sure. What would life in such a chaotic system even look like? He had to wonder, would they look like them or some gross amalgamation of anatomy? Well, it was impossible to know unless the system did turn out to be inhabited. Leon continued to monitor the situation for a while. 
it soon became relatively clear that the only point of interest in the system was the binary pair. There were not even any detectable planets in the system. They had likely been thrown out of the inner system when the White Dwarf had taken up permanent residence to begin cannibalizing its larger sibling. Zombie stars, they were sometimes called. And looking at the view, he could see why. A huge plume of glowing plasma was being lifted off the surface of the larger yellow star. The plume must have been 100,000 kilometers in diameter. Such a mind-boggling number that he had a hard time grasping the concept even as it played out before his own eye. The expansive clouds of plasma that roiled off the surface of the yellow sun were siphoned towards that tiny white speck that orbited near it. The small point of the white dwarf was tiny, the small sphere of dense matter only about the size of Earth, maybe slightly larger. But even with its incredible difference in scale, the star being more than 100 times its diameter, the white dwarf bullied the star. Throwing it around such was the influence of its gravitational pull. It must have been at least half the mass of the larger star compressed into such a dense sphere. Leon couldn't help but be impressed by the streamer of matter that spiralled down into that white hot ball. It looked for all the world like a piece of pasta being slurped down a drain. The approximation made him smile a bit. It was a funny way of looking at it. The small hot stellar corpse was just hungry gorging itself on the relatively cool outer layers of its host. It was akin to some great cosmic parasite. It was less cute when he thought about it that way, and so he tried to change his mind, instead focusing on the other matter that needed attending too, principally his engagement to Natalia. Leon sat back into his chair, the restraints clattering as the harnesses jangled together. He had all the arrangements made, the rings set, and even the people who he wanted involved. He figured now was as good a place as any, though he might have the ship move further in system before the ceremony. It would make for a better view after all. He smiled. Yes, it was time to do what he should have done months ago. Maybe this would finally plug that sense of emptiness in his heart. Only time would tell. Leon stood as best he could in the observation deck. His mag boots were locked to the metal plate at the base of the podium that Oliver drifted behind the very same one that Terry and Taylor had used for their own marriage ceremony. While not required legally on their small world that was the ship, the ceremony was deemed an important part of their preserved culture. A way for them to connect and revisit memories from home, plus Joyce had baked another cake. The rare occurrence was made possible by the incredibly limited amount of flour and pure sugar they had on board. Technically, they had several tons of each, but over the course of two decades that would go fast if not rationed. The observation deck was brightly lit, the radiance of twin stars making the room shine like it was under the noonday sun back home. The warm yellow light was a great comfort to him after years of the clinical white lights of the ship. He spared a glance out the side window. The small white dwarf was still busy cannibalizing its larger twin. The long streamer of hot gases looked almost cartoonish from this distance. They were close enough for the stars to be more than simple pinpricks of light, but Leon had not wanted to stray too close to the dying behemoth. It might not be dangerous, but neither was it exactly safe. Leon smiled as he felt Oliver pat his shoulder. The man had that damn snake with him still. Max sat calmly on the man's shoulders. Her mosaic body coiled loosely around his neck, her fins waving gently in the microgravity as she maintained her precarious positioning. She seemed to understand that some matter of import was happening, or was he humanizing the alien too much? Perhaps she was simply calm because of a large breakfast. He shook his head slightly. Oliver must have taken it for nerves, as the man whispered to him suddenly, Hey, take a deep breath, mate. I know it's a big step, but it is the right one, a real ripsnorter. The man's confidence did help him a little, and he did as instructed, taking a deep breath. Before he had the chance to let it out, Music started to play. The age-old customary tune, Here Comes the Bride, caused him to look towards the airlock. What he saw caused him to let out the breath explosively, his snort getting a chuckle from Oliver as the assembled crew collectively turned to look back towards the door. It was Natalia and Myung. The two were wearing their standard grey coveralls, pretty much the only clothing that was on board besides undershirts and garments, but she managed to make it look stunning all the same. Natalia's face was radiant, 
Her dark brown hair was pinned back to keep it out of her face, but even still it fanned out behind her head like the feathers of some showy bird. He watched, transfixed, as she slowly pulled her way through the microgravity to the podium. As she took her place across from him, he felt the hollowness inside him fill with love. She was the fire that burned his soul, the light that blinded his eyes. She was his sun and his moon. These were the thoughts that trundled through his mind. Soon he found himself being prompted by Oliver to speak. He hesitated for the slightest second, all the worries in his mind reaching out like skeletal hands, threatening to drag him under. But he shook them off, his resolve hardening like the point of a forged spear dipped in the quenching oil. I do. He spoke loudly and clearly. She responded the same after the next prompting. I do. He smiled as he presented her the ring he had chosen. He saw her gasp slightly at the remarkable craftsmanship of it, the sparkle of the gem matching the luster of her eyes. She in turn slipped his dense ring onto his hand before grabbing his lapels and pulling him in for a deeply salacious kiss that drew laughter and a couple whistles from the amassed crew. Leon felt himself blush like a schoolboy as she released him and smiled. Oliver chuckled and said, Well, I was going to say kiss the bride, but I see she has it well covered already. This drew another round of laughter from the others and a chuckle from himself. The ceremony was over. Now it was time to retire to the mess hall for a wedding dinner and cake. As the room was vacated loudly, Natalia pulled him to the side and hugged him. He held her back, the two of them drifting through the air slowly before Leon reached out to steady them on a nearby chair. I love you. Natalia blinked at him, the slow bounce of her lashed as pretty as could be. He brushed a few stray hairs from her face and motioned towards the door with his head. I love you too, more than words can express, but I think we would be greatly missed at the celebration seeing as how they are in our honour. She giggled and whispered into his ear. Oh yeah, but I can think of a few reasons to make them wait. Leon smiled and shook his head. My, my, you are a fast mover. How could I possibly resist such charm? Oh, I know, with cake. She snorted and poked him in the gut. He pretended to be injured, letting out a wheeze as she laughed again. Oh, knock it off, you great big baby. My big, strong military man wants some cake, huh? Well, it just so happens that I was thinking the same thing. Besides, if we don't get up there now, there won't be any cake left. You know how much Oliver loves Joyce's cooking. He just chuckled and nodded. They detangled themselves and moved towards the exit. Leon entered the airlock and turned around. His eyes narrowed as he looked back towards the observation window. For a second he thought he had seen a shadow move outside the ship near the corner of the glass. Before he could dwell on it more, the doors closed, and Natalia started talking rapidly about how nice the ceremony was, and the rings and Oliver being in charge of the vows. Before he knew it, the brief glimpse was out of mind, his focus entirely on her, and the passion with which she spoke. He smiled again, knowing that in all the universe there was no place he would have rather been than with her at this moment. On a tiny moat of dust drifting in an uncaring cosmos full of dangers and mystery, equal sign, equal sign, end of transmission, equal sign, equal sign.